Okay, so you may have seen this description on the Meetup site. Maybe that's why you're here tonight, I hope. Um, we're going to talk about how to optimize your online donations. So Eli did tell you a little bit about IATS. We are a payment processor. And we specialize in services for nonprofits. We support 10,000 charities all over the world uh, with their credit card and ACH, which is direct debit processing. So here's what I have planned for tonight. Um, first off, we're going to do a little kind of warm up to get the juices flowing on this topic. Then we'll go through some challenges or problems with online donation forms that are very common. Uh, why these are important and the impact that they might have. And finally, some suggested solutions that you can implement to address those issues. And then there's going to be a little group challenge. But throughout, I would have to encourage you, if you have any questions or comments, or if you would like to challenge me on something in a nice way, of course, by all means, that's why I'm here. So don't be shy. Okay, our first little group activity and question to the audience. If you are working at a nonprofit, and I'm assuming a lot of you are, how are you driving traffic? How are you driving your audience to your website and your online donation form? Anyone want to share what they're up to now, what their plans are for seasonal giving? Yeah. Email marketing. Email marketing. Awesome. That's a great example. We're shooting 52 videos a week, 52 videos a week for the next year. And then we're going to. I uh, have a Friday night show, which is a streaming video, and will become the major uh, aggressive advocacy content provider in Canada. Very exciting. Very exciting. Video engagement. People love watching videos online, don't they? Eli. I'm using Twitter. Not very successfully at all. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Anyone else want to share what they're doing to get people on their website and inspired to fill out those online donation forms? Anything else like this? These are some fundraising channels or communications channels that nonprofits are using to drive people to their websites. Of course, some of them we just talked about. Direct mail is still huge in the nonprofit space, of course. Face to face, uh, which we see, you know, Plan Canada has a huge campaign running. You probably see these, um, the About a Girl, I'm a Girl because I'm a Girl, pardon me, campaign. You've seen them downtown, I'm sure. And then, of course, we have trends or out-of-home advertising, TV, search engine marketing events. There's all kinds of different uh, communication strategies to engage the donor audience, of course. And ultimately, get them to your website and making donations. So why are we doing this? Why do we want people on our website and making donations? Well, this shouldn't come as a shock. Everybody is online every day. 85% of U.S. adults are online every day. And three-quarters of the U.S. adult audience are on social media every day. Now, when it comes to online giving, that was up by almost 14% in 2013 compared to 2012 numbers, so that's, this number is growing. Overall, it accounted for, you know, just over 6% of total giving last year, but, of course, um, that number is growing, as I mentioned. And if we look at total um, charitable donations from Canadian taxpayers, in 2012, it was over 8.3 billion. So if we apply the logic of maybe 6% of that was online, that's $500 million. So that's, that's a large amount in Canada. So obviously very important to have a strategy to get people to your website and making donations. Now, if we look at online donors in particular, um, online is the dominant channel for new donors, 64 and younger, and Research shows that donors that are acquired through online means have a higher lifetime or cumulative value to the organization than donors that are acquired via direct mail or other means. So this is interesting. And also, online donors tend to give larger gifts on average than gifts that are um, sent via direct mail. Okay, more questions for the audience. Does anyone know or does anyone have any idea about the traffic to their website or their organization's website that results in ultimately in an online donation? Anyone have any data to share? Does anyone know approximately how many visitors get to their online donation form and then bounce away and not complete a donation? Chad, are you raising your hand? 
I was stretching actually. <laughs> I, I do have a, a bit of an idea, which you know, I'm, it, it, it's a rough idea, but we can usually like let's say we did an email class. I can see from my email tool, like okay, how many people open the email, how many people actually click through the page, and then at the end I can see how many people donated the page. But there may be some better analytics, or maybe perhaps a better way to not have to look through different spots and pieces of the puzzle. Right. This is the marketer and the fundraiser's dilemma, seeing where all the analytics are. Does anyone else have any experience with measuring the success of their online donation form or driving tra traffic to that page? No? Well, interestingly, research shows, research from BlackBot, the software giant, shows that the average charity's online donation form sees an abandonment rate of 50 to 70 percent. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it means that people that actually, you know, receive an appeal, get an email, some other communication, go to the organization's website, land on the donation form, the majority of them leave without making a donation. So, there are things that you can implement that can improve these numbers, certainly. And I will discuss some of them now, hopefully with some uh, comments from the audience. Feel free if you have any. Okay, so, one big thing that IATS we are often talking about with our clients is when it comes to your online donation form, it's very important to keep it on your website and avoid redirecting your donors to a third party. So when, when we talk about that third party redirect, uh, we're referring to when your donor is sent to another site to make a donation. And certainly, there are advantages to having someone else entirely handle your online donations. For example, Canada Helps or Network for Good is big in the United States. But 70% of donors apparently drop off when they're sent to another site to complete the online donation form. So that's a huge number. It's very important you know, to keep donors on your site and engaged in the content on your site as much as you can. And here, actually I just wanted to mention, I forgot to mention this earlier, every organization or screen capture I have of a website I'm there, uh, and throughout the presentation, sorry, is a local IATS client based in Vancouver. So here we have the Fur Bearers uh, Protection Organization, and they have their headquarters on West Broadway near NEC. I just happened to notice that last week. And they've done a really good job of keeping their donation form on their organization site. The look and feel is consistent with the rest of the site, which is very important. Um, some organizations have a continuity and look and feel on their online donation form, but the actual URL is hosted by another company. And we've heard and noticed that donors are becoming savvy about if they click on donate and they're redirected to xyz.furbearsdefenders.com, that there may be some confusion. Am I really donating to the organization? Am I really still on the site? So that is a factor to consider as well. Any questions on this? Another important um, point is a compelling call to action. And I'm sure this is, this is a big part of all of your fundraising messages, but specifically as it relates to the landing page on your website with the online donation form, you really want to make it a personal appeal to that engaged donor to make, take the action, to put in their credit card details or their bank account details and donate today. Um, Two examples here are local organization, the BC SPCA. They had this, you know, incredible, you know, they broke it down. Uh, for 60 cents a day, you can save lives 365 days a year. Yes, I want to. Um, Covenant House Vancouver, they made a point of saying, you can help innocent girls like Kaylee or innocent children like Kaylee. Give now. It's a very strong language, very clear language, and a personal compelling call to action is really important as well to convert those site visitors to donors. Does anyone have an example of a call to action or language they've used in their you know, online donation form that they've seen a good success with? Yeah?
great example. Eli, do you have a comment? Yeah, yeah I have you know, the Suzuki Foundation. I found the exact same experience that there's our abandonment rates and like no one would get into our donation form actually completing it. So our biggest success was actually doing the same thing of site hijack that sounds like we used to, which is to say at those key times for core campaigns right before the holidays, right. basically we put up like a splash page taking up the whole homepage saying if you want to see the real site, click this link here. But actually you want to go to the donation form today. This is what it's all about. Um, and that was the only time we ever had any kind of high conversion rate on the process. Could I, would this remind me of your um, The North Pole is Melting campaign at the Dave Suzuki Foundation? I don't know if I was part of that. It's probably like the people after me who do better work. <laughs> no, okay, well, never mind. <laughs> I just remember that one and I found it to be particularly compelling, certainly. Great example, yeah. Okay, here's an interesting one. Unnecessary fields on the donation form. This is a big one. Um, it comes down to what data you really need from that donor with that perhaps initial first time donation. Um, I know many organizations use a donor database or content management system where you can probably you know, build on the information you know about that donor contact record over time. And perhaps you don't need to have 25 fields on the online donation form. This logic also applies to you know, online shopping carts. Less is more, less fields is more. Well, an example, a local example I found here was uh, Open Media Network and they've really stripped down the fields on their online donation form. And I, in fact, I went through, we support 120 odd clients in the, in the city of Vancouver, and I reviewed many, many, many donation forms for this presentation, and was shocked by how many had a lot of fields to complete. Like maybe the middle name, if you're never gonna use the data in your database. Question, comment? Comment. Okay. I work for Open Media, <laughs> Great, please say that. I, I'm impressed with it. And you might, you're gonna, I think you're also come up later in the presentation, but I won't give that away just yet. Okay? <laughs> just another comment. We just redid our donation page, and when we looked at dozens and dozens, apparently we also looked at your page and showed that as a model, but our provider wouldn't allow us to publish a page without our, all of our um, navigation and So, in this case, so does that mean it has to be listed somewhere um, on that page yeah. next to where you're capturing your payment details? Right. Right. If you right. went to the bottom of the page that says contact, it's actually removing the whole system. It has to be something they can click to that clearly doesn't hide it. So you can have a word box of contact. Right. And that doesn't get in the way. And by being at the bottom, they don't see it until they've already come to that. Yeah. But if they look for it, they'll find it. We, we do have that information on that page. It's just uh, not slide. Way thought. down the very bottom. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we sort of just we just sort of addressed this, but um, any you know, you just mentioned Shell. You just mentioned that you went through a process of looking at best practices for donation forms and including yours. Um, we were at a conference, an Association of Fundraising Professionals conference last year, where we did a booth promotion, and we said that anybody who came to our booth, we would make a five dollar donation to an organization of their choice. And of course, this was a fundraisers conference, so everybody there worked for a charity. And it was amazing to us how many people got to their own organization website, couldn't find a donation form, and then couldn't complete the donation, and were shocked. Like, we saw this all day long at this conference. It was painful. You know, oh, what? I thought it was here on the website. Oh, geez, this is taking forever. So, yeah. Um, does anyone know offhand? Or has anyone looked at that on their organization? It's just um, something that is becoming increasingly 
you know, relevant for this optimization of online donation forms. Less is more. Strip it down. In fact, a very interesting man named Jason Shim, who uh, works for an organization in Toronto called Pathways to Education Canada, he showed me a, a four field, like, pardon me, four click, four field online donation form concept that he was trying to pilot. So the idea of stripping it down to the as little work as possible for the donor is important. Okay, so this is something that sort of touches on that experience we had with our booth promotion that was an eye-opening experience for us, is um, navigation and where the donation form is on your site. So when I, was, when I was getting ready for this presentation, like I said, I was navigating to many websites and noticing that the donation form in some cases was in a tab called support us with, you know, the 12 different ways you can support the organization. And I might not have intuitively known to look there to find the donation form. So if site visitors can't find it as soon as they land on your site, it's very possible that you could lose them. And data shows that already it's hard to keep donor or site visitors getting to your donation form and completing the donation. So, you know, they say you should just assume nobody has ever heard of your organization or been to your website before and, and optimize the content for that audience. And if you think about it, if we have a conversion rate of 1%, so 1% of your site visitors actually complete an online donation, imagine if you converted that to 3%, it would make a huge difference just by implementing some of these tweaks that we've just discussed. Eli? So just going back to that minimum form field question. Right. As payment processors, I imagine you know what is actually the minimum required to, to make things happen on your side of things. Like, what do you guys need for us to actually make a payment go through? It's a very good question. Steven. <laughs> well, that's my boss, Steven. <laughs> At the pay funds, we just need credit card information and expiry date and the CDT number on an online form. So, not even a name, or is that part of that? So, sort of between us, really, banks don't even check the names on credit cards for the transactions. So, the, in some cases, it's not even usage. But sometimes they check it, sometimes they don't. <coughs> The, the most critical the bare minimum is literally the number, the, the card number, the CD2 expiry date. And some organizations want a risk verification system set up on the stuff, um, in which case you obviously need an address. But when it comes to names and addresses and telephone numbers and emails, none of that is necessary. But it's not good practice, obviously. So there's a fine balance between what you capture so that you can relate multiple donations over a period of time to the same content. So that's where really email generally is a very, very good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously a first name and a last name and a telephone number. But uh, in those cases, you don't need a telephone number. Because there's other ways that you can be used with the payment rights. If you are stuck with another payment processor that requires things like postal code, and then doesn't validate them all the time, but 1% to 5% of donations, it has mismatches. Do you have any suggestions how to deal with the vendor? Unfortunately, you're stuck with some who isn't you. Uh, how do you deal with the vendor to explain to them that this isn't needed and it's costing you donations? Uh, the worst part being, of course, that the error message that it generates through the API to the thing and the stuff says postal code doesn't match address, right. which isn't actually what it is. It, I'm sure someone here does. Do you have any suggestions what we do? Well, is there a chance to, I mean, because I know legally that part, we're actually collecting information because we need it for our records, but the problem is it doesn't. So the big problem with address verification is it's so blunt, it's unbelievable. So yeah. if you go street, S-T-R-E-E-T, -E and you and the donor puts in S-T-R-T, it types that picks it up. If you put a space in the, in the, the, the the address, the, the postal code, it'll pick it up. So you get different levels of address verification. So it sounds to me like it's address verification, but it's, not. It's just on the postal code. code. But is, is there, so you can't just do this professionally. Is there something I can tell to your not quite so well equipped colleagues that they, in fact, can just turn that off? Or is there some reason that maybe they're under your jurisdiction, or there's some reason why it has to be on? Because maybe just, it, it's, it happens often enough that we're having a staff person phoning all these people back 
right. which is not good. But you, you know, you can see a donation fail. You obviously don't want to leave that money on the table. So it's a, it, that becomes a very interesting discussion because what happens is sometimes banks will insist on address verification depending on the donor form. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Curry. <laughs> so some some organizations or banks will insist on address verification based on how they feel the fraud could come through on their donation form. So believe it or not, there are actually quite a few charities or even for profit organizations, they don't even have the C D V two number. So they capture the credit card and they capture the expiry date, but not the C D V two number. And if you don't do that, then what is the only other alternative you've got to preventing fraud on that form is address verification. So if they feel that that form is at a risk of some kind for some sort of security reason or fraud, they may insist on address verification. So if you can prove to them and show to them that you, you've got a certain amount of upfront verification of security measures in place, like TV2 and it's on an HTTPS site and all those sorts of things, then you've got a much better chance of saying, okay, well, can we switch AVS off? AVS being address verification, yeah. 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 Good Thank you. Not that I want to take this wildly off the track, but while I have experts here, I tried to make a donation to the U.S. Uh, service network for good yesterday. They are basically like Canada helps mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. And I have been, Van City won't, allow my credit card to make a donation to that site. Right. There's been some blockage. And I imagine like if I was at Suzuki, I would always get basically false donations, like $1 donations, people yes. trying to validate yes. false credit cards. Yes. Well, like, what's happening in this process? I'm not going to steal here with Thunder because she speaks to that a little later. Okay, great. Thank you. We're going to talk about that in a moment. It is super relevant. Yes? Uh, can I ask a question make a comment? We find that the less quality, we find that if you're not someone What I recommend is test forms. So it's. And it also depends on what they're donating towards. So if it's literally just a $10 donation because they want to donate to a specific cause that it's, say, the Google, sorry, yeah. um, as opposed to they want to set up a, a commitment to you over a long period of time that you're a recurring donor and they really buy into your cause then it's different. So it, it comes down to that call to action again. Is, are you, is the call to action just a quick donation and get on going? Um, get it and move on and then build a relationship with them at a stage via events or via emails or whatever using the CRM system? Or is, it, is the call to action to say, we need you to support us? Um, there's, a, there's a UK agency that I support. Um, well, I but you, you literally support your child for a period of 10, 15 years. So that one is much information from you because you're literally making a commitment. And because I'm making such a huge commitment, I'm willing to give that information. But I'm not willing to give the, 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 the same amount of information to Heather's poodle that's got a limp. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's like, sorry. <laughs> but it, it's actually a very really vital point that is, is your call to action and when they click on the donate button, is to say, what are they donating and how much of a commitment are they making, depending on the types of bills. So we have a lot of charities that have five or six forms, active forms, all those the same bank account, all, but all the very different, different reasons and intentions behind it. One more question. Just final comment for the unless there are more. Um, I guess, yeah, the less more is true. The 
flip side of the coin is if you are providing tax receipts and business information, you have to collect the mm -hmm. tax receipt, mm -hmm. including home mailing address, because these laws were written before this fancy internet came existed, right? Yeah. So to collect that information, you want to keep the tax receipt. Okay. So what I've seen a partner do, and I just quite find it what was interesting, was they said, do you want a tax receipt? Two fields. Mm. Oh, don't you want a tax receipt? Two fields. Do you want a tax receipt? Form right. filled out. So it gave them the opportunity to say how much information you can show. It's one additional thing, but it did give them, or the other one that I've seen is, um, it's the, you know, asterisks usually apply mandatory. They have like the little triangle, and the triangle said if you want a tax receipt, fill out these forms. If you don't want a tax receipt, don't fill out. <coughs> That is sort of the rationale, that just the very quick scan of, oh, I don't have time for this. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's better to keep it to mo mostly required fields as opposed to not required. And, you know, it comes down to, if they do tell you their middle name is Joan, mm -hmm. um, will you ever do anything with that data? You know, I saw a lot of forms where I thought, gosh, why do they, you know, a salutation. Or if you're never going to address somebody with, as Ms. Heather Balachi, <laughs> on a direct mail piece, then maybe you don't need that data. I don't know. It's just an example. Yeah. Okay. So back to the, just the navigation, one more thing, one, you know, to touch on that. Um, so making the donation call to action in the language very front and center on perhaps the header of your site or just make it very obvious, the big donate now button or whatever obvious language you choose. Um, and of course, we were just talking about testing. Um, not every organization has the ability to, you know, have a web developer on hand to say, let's try this for a month and let's try this for a month and see the difference, but, you know, it's important to try that. And then offering multiple ways for the site visitor to access the donation page because, you know, people, I've seen people navigate around our website where I think that it's intuitive. Of course, if you need our partners, you go to About Us. And a lot of people just don't think the same way that the, the webmaster thinks. So it's important to keep that in mind. Okay, here's another huge thing. Apparently, even still, only 20% of online donation forms are mobile friendly. Does this surprise anybody? Or does this sound like, yeah, that probably makes sense? I'm just, yeah. Now, why this is important? According to Artez Interactive, Toronto-based, you know, nonprofit uh, fundraising software company, 30% uh, of traffic to charity websites is now coming from mobile devices, and if we look at online donations, 15% of donations are coming from mobile web browsers. Now, keep in mind, actually, this data is from 2013. I imagine these numbers have even grown since then. So we have to consider, you know, you don't want to lose those engaged you know, potential donors because the process on their phone is cumbersome or not even possible. So, the solution. I think that's, um, I think it's open media again down there, yeah. Kudos. Um, invest in responsive design. Now, the idea of responsive design is to have a website that renders according to the size of the device that's viewing it, basically. Um, and if you're not, if you can't make that change to your entire site, maybe just the one page where your online donation form is. It's an idea. And the suggestion would be to test the donation process from a mobile device and be, be really critical. Have your mom try to do it from her, you know, Blackberry or whatever. Okay. Another important thing we did, did we, well, we might have touched on this a little bit later is how do you encourage recurring or monthly gifts from your online donation form? And all of you work at nonprofits, you understand that this is a very important thing. If you have people on board and committed to making a, a recurring gift, often it's a monthly gift, the lifetime value increases dramatically. It reduces your cost of handling donations. 
Um, and it, you know, makes it harder for the donor to stop giving to organization. So the idea is you should make it straightforward and easy when they're inspired to make what they think is a one-time donation, and maybe they get to your form and they say, no, I really do want to help those animals at the BCSBCA 365 days a year, for example. So the idea is that on your online donation form, ask them for a recurring gift. This is, the this is an example from the BC Cancer Foundation. I really like the way they did it, where they had a nice looking form that popped up and they had the monthly donation auto-selected as opposed to the one-time donation. And they had pre different um, amounts associated depending if it was a monthly donation or a one-time donation. And um, a lot of organizations separate um, if you want to give a one-time gift or a monthly gift, they separate the forms. And we realize that there are, you know, accounting and perhaps reconciliation advantages to doing that and keeping them in separate buckets. But the idea is that, you know, if someone's willing to make a one-time gift on your online donation form, they all might also be willing to set up a monthly or a recurring gift on the same form. And, of course, you want to make it easy and intuitive for people to do so. Yeah. Any questions on this one? So, oh, sorry. You know, that's a very good point, and it's the same that could be said for if you go to an online donation form and they have the gift amount, you know, pre-selected to $100, exactly. and you have to then say, actually, no, I can only give 20 right. So I guess the reasoning behind it is if you make the suggestion, Maybe someone will go for it. I don't know. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, we've actually found when you when you lowball the amount that you ask people for, uh, they tend to give higher donations um, because I think it feels better to up your donation from what they're asking than to produce it. Interesting, very interesting. In psychology, I guess that yeah. makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, if your organization is big enough, list, you should be doing testing. Right. Baby testing. Yeah. These things. Yeah. Uh, and at the very least, even if you don't have a small list. It's not a bad idea when you do an email to split your list of people who previously donated above a certain amount and send it to a page with asks that have most of them higher than that amount. Probably not all of them higher than that amount. But even if you only have a few dozen donors, that's right there. That might have a donation of 50 to 100 bucks, which is going to take the time to set up the second page. If you're in the thousands of people, that kind of split is almost definitely worth it. I mean, you need to have a big list before AD testing is going to give you a real but at least right. the split of, we know you already give 50 bucks, we're not going to bother asking you a page that's 5, 10, 50, 25, 50. It will be one that's 25, 50, 100, 200. So you know they're already at that level. You might as well hint that, you know, 50 is where you start. I like that, yeah, but that doesn't involve a whole bunch of crazy coding. That involves like one change in your query when you set things up. Mm -hmm. Um, I have two uh, sort of comments. Um, uh, the NDP, the federal NDP, did something really sneaky with its donation amounts the other day that I wanted to share because it was. Uh, uh, they sent an email saying chip in five dollars, but then when you clicked the link, five dollars was not one of the amounts that you were presented with as an option. Interesting. Four dollars and ten dollars. So you had to make the decision to either go with four bucks or ten or manually write five dollars. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many other people this worked for, but they got an additional like five bucks out of me because of doing this. Um, so um, and I know that the Obama campaign, which is a really <laughs> big deal to us progressives, um, the Obama campaign actually got it to the point where they could. Uh, take a look at like what the donor's average gift was, and then ask them for an amount that was slightly higher than that. Um, but I mean, that, that's they have huge amounts of capacity and money to spend um, in, you know, doing that sort of thing. 
So that's the, the first thing, you know, the, the fiddling with donation amounts um, to sort of gently nudge people up in a little bit uh, is worth doing, um, and uh, it's not too hard to read the game. Um, in terms of like having a forum that asks for both monthly and one times, um, we found that um, what drives traffic to our form tends to be when we promote the form a lot. Um, and when you're doing that, um, it, it goes back to what you said about the call to action. Pick one thing and ask for that. Um, don't split your ask in terms of we want both a one-time and a monthly contribution. Right. Um, so it, it, this would be when you're driving people to the form. I think also you, you meant, mentioned like have multiple donation forms. Mm -hmm. This is why. Mm -hmm. right? Um, if somebody comes to the form just as an uh, organic traffic on their own, then yes, it's going to present them with both a one-time and monthly option. Right. Um, and and it's, you know, that is something they can do if they want. But, but that's not how most people make it to the donation form. Most of the people arrive because we have promoted it and encouraged them to go there. Right. So we have two separate forms, one that is for one-time donation amounts and one that is for monthly reoccurring amounts. And when we have a call to action that makes sense to ask for reoccurring gifts, mm -hmm. and we don't send them to a form that has a split ask, we send them to a form that has only recurring gifts. Um, there is like a button on the page that says don't want to give recurring to here to go away, but it's, it's very separate from the form. It's not considered as a field that they have to fill out the form. Thanks for sharing. Excellent insights. I think my husband's a recurring donor. Nice. We can talk later, yeah. <laughs> Actually, he is. Okay, so consi some considerations is uh, if, you, if you are promoting a recurring you know, gift program, like this gentleman just was talking about, is um, the integration with your payment processor. Of course, this is what we do because we support 10,000 charities. Now, will your software support what's called tokenization? And I don't have that word up here, but that is the secure storage of the sensitive credit card details. So basically, that allows the software to process the donation on a schedule on your behalf. Or we do have clients still that upload kind of a batch file of their monthly donations. Um, so there are two ways to man manage it, either automatically through your payment processor or your software, or kind of a manual process. But of course, you have to consider how the sensitive credit card data is being stored and handled and transmitted. Now, of course, for recurring giving, ACH, which actually stands for Automated Clearinghouse, but it refers to authorized bank account withdrawals, is a really effective method for recurring transactions. So the overall costs are lower than using credit cards for recurring gifts, and you experience less rejected transactions because people don't change their credit card details, I'm sorry, people don't change their bank accounts as often as they might change their credit card details. And bank accounts don't get compromised as often as uh, you know, credit cards do. For example, a lot of religious organizations use monthly ACH gifts for their tithing programs, as an example. And some final thoughts, you know, just to throw like two huge other points in at the end. Um, visually representing security on your online donation form. So choosing a HTTPS connection to demonstrate that the page has additional security layers incorporated is important. Donors are becoming very savvy about that. And a lot of organizations use um, icons or badges from their uh, payment processor or for the, from their, whoever they use to make that page secure. So anything you can do to visually reassure the donor that their details are safe with you is also very important. And Stephen did touch on this earlier, but there is a nasty reality that there are credit card fraudsters that target charities and online donation forms to test the credit card details they have stolen. So Eli, I think you mentioned that the David Suzuki Foundation, you saw a lot of $1 donations Constant. coming from all over the world. Boom. Boom. Yeah, so this is a, certainly, because all of our clients are nonprofits, we deal with this every day. And um, a lot of payment processors do have tools in place that allow you to, you know, restrict where uh, where you allow transactions to come from, or which countries, which banks, 
you know, from certain high-risk places in the world, you might be able to block if you've seen a lot of fraud from those places. Um, so this is something to consider as well. And also, just one other thing I should mention that we've also seen unfortunate, an unfortunate number of our clients fall victim to this credit card online donation refund scam. I'll just give you a quick synopsis. Donor makes the donation online, $3,500 with their visa, which in fact is a stolen visa. And they call up the organization and say, oh, Mr. Cherry, I meant to donate $35. Can you please refund $3,465 to this other credit card? And this is a, it's a huge problem. We're trying to raise awareness around it. Um, basically, any situation where a refund is requested on a different card than the original transaction, beware, beware, beware. And if, there, if you have people back at your organization that handle online gifts and these kinds of things, please share this with them. We have an um, article on our website about it. Um, it's something that we just want to raise awareness around it because it's unfortunately a reality. Any questions on that? Refund scam. 